Welcome uh, to UI, the Swedish Institute of International Affairs, and to our uh, evening seminar on uh, cybersecurity. Um, society, government, business, and individuals are increasingly depending on cyberspace in their everyday life and for governmental functions and for societal functions like health and medicine, infrastructure, finance, you name it. So more and more, whether we like it or not, we depend on cyberspace, a functioning cyberspace, for everything to, to work smoothly. And obviously, at the same time, we have an increasing number of uh, problems or malware or, and threats, uh, attacks also. Uh, one uh, thing here that goes on is the, the development of automated uh, hacking tools that's been uh, around for a long, long time. So you don't really need to be a real geek to be able to use malware that can cause havoc on the internet anymore. So it's uh, becoming more individualized and available for many, many people. Whether you are a government employee or a business uh, industrial spy or simply an individual sitting in your, in your room. And uh, as has been obvious since the beginning, uh, the development and uh, global diffusion of the internet, uh, the threats on, on in cyberspace are particularly difficult to understand to, and to analyze. We have a, an, an ongoing fog of war, you could say, since it's always very, very difficult to identify if there is an incident, if it really is an attack or if it's just something crashing, for example, at the beginning. And it's also very usually difficult to identify if there is really an attack. Who is behind it? Who did it? Uh, who are the culprits? And also, what are they really doing? And why are they doing it? And at the end of the day, what are the consequences of this? Not just for this particular computer network, but for wider society and government. And it has also been argued that uh, things like, uh, which are common uh, arguments in general security planning, like deterrence and retaliation, are extremely hard to apply in, in the sphere of cyber defense and cyber security. Who do, who do you deter against and how do you retaliate? How do you, why, and is that really effective? can be questioned. It's also clear that uh, cyber threats by their very nature defy state borders and organizational boundaries. Uh, that is also why international responses to these threats become particularly pertinent. Um, which is also why organizations such as NATO and the European Union deal with these threats and uh, since many years have been trying to develop policies and strategic planning and even organizational units to handle them since uh, it's been argued with many global problems that you can't deal with it as a nation on your own. You need, you need allies, you need support, you need to work across borders to deal with cross-border threats. Um, <coughs> it's also noteworthy that uh, cybersecurity has been up and down on policy agendas since the very globalization of the internet in the mid-90s or early 90s. Uh, already in the mid-90s, uh, analysts in the US in particular talked about the, the possibility of an electronic Pearl Harbor, a major devastating attack that basically shut down a society uh, through b massive attacks. And uh, when 9-11 happened, and these, these were obviously physical attacks, or as a cyber analyst would call them, offline attacks. Um, using physical kinetic force, not virtual or electronic attack. I, you could see on policy agendas that, that the cyber threats that were really high on the agenda sort of came down and were forgotten for a little while, or were not prioritized as much. Until the attacks in Estonia in, in, in the spring of 2007, after those massive denial distributed denial of service attacks on, on uh, governmental and civil society and business websites, we had them, these threats back on the policy agendas and new measures were taken, both in NATO and the EU. We will hear more about that very soon. So, um, both NATO and the EU have for some time, quite some time, developed strategies and recently updated these strategies. Uh, and that's why we are here to discuss, so what purposes do these strategies serve? What is the quality of the risk analysis? Uh, what lessons can we learn on how strat strategies like this should be designed and developed? Um, so I'm uh, Johan Eriksson, I'm Professor of Political Science and I'm Head of Research here at the uh, Institute of International Affairs. And I'm pleased to welcome four distinguished experts on uh, cyber security and cyber defense. And uh, 
first out we uh, have um, Thomas Elkir Nissen. Uh, he will soon uh, come up here and give an introductory talk on NATO. Um, he is military researcher at the Royal Danish Defence College. And following him we will have uh, an introduction by Ulrik Franke from uh, he senior scientist at the Swedish Defence Research Agency FOE. And after that we will have uh, Christine Bertora Sandvik. Uh, she is senior researcher at the Peace Research Institute Oslo Prio. And finally we will have uh, Lars Nikander, director for the Center of Asymmetric Threat Studies, CATS, here at the Swedish National Defense College, uh, colleagues here in this building. Uh, and they will give some short presentations. After that, we will have uh, a little round of discussion amongst the panelists. And then we will open up for questions from, from the audience and have a discussion with you. So hopefully we will be more enlightened uh, about what's going on in NATO and the EU. You might not have definite answers to any of the questions, but hopefully we will at least address some of them. So without uh, further ado, uh, I'd like to give the floor to Thomas Elke Nissen. Uh, and also, uh, just uh, for, your, um, for those of you who are on Twitter, and, uh, and given the topic of this uh, event, it's particularly relevant to say that you might use our hashtag UE event. Uh, and this seminar is also being filmed and later put on YouTube. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. First and foremost, thank you to you, Dr. Hersen, and to Uyi for inviting me. Second of all, I'll just wait a few minutes here. Thank you very much. My name is, as you said, Thomas Nissen. I work at the Danish Defence College, where i uh, employed as a military analyst and work with everything within what we call information warfare, or information within warfare, actually, which covers broadly from strategic communication or information warfare to related cyber aspects of this. Um, a part of that is also being aware of what NATO does in regards to NATO cyber security, NATO cyber defence, and so on and so forth. Uh, with only eight minutes to my disposal, this will be a crash course into NATO security policy and NATO cyber defense strategies. So, first and foremost, what are we talking about? When you talk about NATO, you do not talk about cyber warfare, because NATO is a defense organization and does therefore not own its own capabilities. NATO does not have any capabilities for conducting offensive operations, neither does NATO want to have a policy for it, that is mainly due to national restrictions and lack of unity between the 28 nations. Second of all, cyber operations. Well, that can be viewed in several ways. Even though NATO only talk about cyber defense, you can find in some of their doctrines for, amongst other things, information operations, references to what is called computer network operations, which entail three different activities being one computer network attack, one being computer network exploitation, and the third being computer network defense. The two first are pre predominantly in NATO doctrine to explain what it is. The third one is what NATO actually does, and that is where, where we're talking about cyber defense and not cyber defense. I do apologize for that. Second of all, this has a rising attention from the political level all the way down through the NATO uh, so-called command and force structure. This means NATO's own organization. NATO is to a very high degree through the 2010 strategic concept and again reaffirming it in the just finished summit in Wales in September, uh, looking at a core task of what is called collective defense. So NATO views cyber defense as one of its core tasks. That is predominantly based upon NATO's view on its own CIS, means computer and information systems, the systems that NATO own and operate for themselves. They see a constant threat to those through a daily attacks, numbering in the thousands, both probing and denial of service of mail accounts, and you name it, all sorts of different attacks goes on on a daily basis and counts in the thousands. Therefore, NATO is very keen on protecting its networks, of course. On the other hand, it is also very 
necessary to make a clear delineation between what is NATO responsibilities and policy and what is national responsibilities. NATO as a organization views its responsibility and task only protecting its own networks, its own IT infrastructure, not the nations. It is a pure national responsibility to protect according to NATO at least, its own critical information infrastructure to include its military infrastructures. Although they are at some points interconnected. Some of NATO's CIS network are connected to member states, military or government networks, and those interfaces are of course to be protected as well. However, the actual protection of national infrastructure is a national responsibility. That is also very clear when you look at defense planning processes in NATO. As Dr. Erison pointed to, then there's becoming an increased connection between what is day-to-day -day cyber risks, cyber threats, which is on a daily basis occurring, and what is a actual use of cyberspace within military operations. Seeing a sole cyber war or a cyber war that only fought in cyberspace is not something that NATO foresees, but it does foresee that any future conflict, any future military operation, NATO-led or otherwise, will entail a very large piece of cyber activities that are conducted in connection with or in concert with normal kinetic military operations. That is also why that um, cyber defense is an active part of NATO defense planning process, which more or less is a roadmap for the nations on which capabilities they ought to develop in the future. When I say ought to, then it's a roadmap they can adhere to or not. They will sign up for different pieces of it or have uh, caveats to other pieces. That is also why you do not find a unanimity within NATO on how critical infrastructure is to be protected, which capabilities you need as a single nation. It can only be guidelines for the nations. However, it is exercised regularly. Each year when NATO does crisis management exercises, that is the other abbreviation uh, for your, those of you who do not speak NATO abbreviations fluently, uh, then cyber defense is an integral part of this. When NATO look at uh, scripts and scenarios to, to train against, then NATO will also look to having pieces of cyber incidents into this uh, exercise. Second, cyber has also become a part of the uh, smart defense initiatives, uh, which were rolled out a few years ago, and predominantly three different areas. First and foremost, it is a question of trying to build and maintain um, awareness and protocols and procedures for identifying crisis and mitigating of uh, cyber crisis within the different nations and how to do decision making in these crises. Second, it is developing training and education programs, uh, everything from basic research conducted at uh, different research institutions within NATO. It's a question of training the technical pieces at the NATO school in, uh, in Italy that deals with CIS problems. It is uh, education and training with cyber defense at the NATO school in Oberammergau and then at a more policy level at the NATO Defense College in Italy. Uh, some of these training programs are also what are called mobile education and training teams. These METTs are used to send out to the nations to assist and mentor and train uh, national capabilities in doing cyber defense. And then there's a very large focus on intelligence sharing within malware, uh, identification and locking of malware and making this available to all of the nation member states in sp specific databases and so on and so forth. Second, it's a core element uh, in strategy. NATO has a cyber policy and a uh, cyber strategy which predominantly uh, rests on three different pillars. The first one is to develop and continuously enhance NATO's own capabilities within cyber defense. That means both protocols, it means physical defense of networks, and it means education and training uh, within NATO. 
The second pillar is about assisting allies. And as the allies are responsible themselves, whatever NATO assists the allies with will always be a question of what the allies request from NATO. NATO has no sort of regime in place that can dictate anything to the nations in regards to how their cyber security and how their policies should look like. And the third pillar is an increased cooperation with partners and with industry. Uh, in an increase in recognition that industry play a larger and larger role in the defense of cyber. Thirdly, there's the question of Article 5. Dr. Erickson mentioned the uh, cyber incident in Estonia in 2007. I was there myself, not that I take any responsibility for anything that went on, but it was a rather particular event. Uh, being there at a conference and all of a sudden this brand new hotel opening only one week before was shut down completely. Everything in this hotel newly built was IP based. But apparently that didn't help anything because everything from telephones to water distribution to heat to doors locking and everything simply shut down at the hotel due to this uh, distributed denial of service attack. The Estonians themselves was left with a threat uh, or at least a perception of being under a cyber attack. Attribution is another question. That was their perception of what was going on. And therefore, they have naturally also looked to NATO for assistance and help. At that point, NATO was not willing to discuss at any level whether or not a cyber attack could constitute anything that could lead to the invokement of Article 5 in the North Atlantic Treaty. Although today, when you look at the summit outputs, and I'll show them in a minute, from the uh, Wales summit, then Article 5 is beginning to emerge as an issue within uh, cyber defense as well. Although it does have a very ambiguous threshold. What is the threshold for actual attack? What, to what degree should it be attributed to a specific geographical place? And from that geographical place to a act of state or an agent of state within international law, that is very ambiguous. And it is not in any way described in, in any detail. However, NATO does put a, quite a bit of emphasis on legal considerations and look to how you can interpret it in standing international law, international humanitarian law, in, in the confines of cyber defense. Although this is very lengthy, and I please don't waste any time reading it because I'll flesh it out in a minute. Uh, that is the 72nd article of the Wales Declaration, which touch upon cyber. What is worth looking at between all those words is pretty much that NATO and its member states reconfirms or reaffirms that cyber is a threat. It's not a question of a risk, it's a question of a threat. And therefore, it's no, no longer a question of how to govern security, it's a question of securitization of cyber. Also, they reaffirm the indivisibility of allied security. Uh, and that basically means that they reaffirm that it's the nation's responsibility to protect their own networks and their own critical infrastructure. NATO is defend its own networks, and with that they mean owned and operated by NATO or NATO organizations. The responsibility on everything else lies with the allies themselves. They also put quite a lot of emphasis on international law, and to that end they refer to the talent manual created by the Center for Security, or Center for of excellence for cyber security in Estonia Tallinn. Although it's a NATO center of excellence, it is not within NATO command structure and therefore not a part of NATO per se, but it does support NATO and support NATO policy and provide advice and research for NATO. Also, they reaffirm that cyber attacks can reach to the threshold of being a security threat, which can at some point evoke Article 5. Although when speaking about Article 5, it is to t be taken by the North Atlantic Council on a case-by-case -case basis, as with everything else. 
there's nothing new in that formulation. That is also the case in, in the case of an armed attack, uh, being very visible or not. It is still a case-by-case -case basis. What is noteworthy is that it has risen on the security agenda to be a part of the discussion or the discourse about Article 5. And I believe my eight minutes are up. Thank you very much, Thomas. A, a very useful uh, uh, introduction to what's going on in NATO. And now we will have a, a short presentation by Ulrich Franke from FOE on uh, the European Union's cybersecurity strategy. Floor right. Yours. Thank you very much. So, from NATO to the European Union. Um, so, I've been asked to give this brief outline of um, the ongoing policy work on behalf of the European Union um, and basically um, I'll outline um, a document uh, that was published in February last year um, jointly published by the Commission on the one hand and the uh, the uh, high representative of the European Union for um, foreign affairs and security policy um, so basically this document starts out with trying to set the stage uh, and describe the context. And um, uh, there are two aspects of this um, introduction that are um, not that prominent uh, throughout the rest of the documents. I, I would like to, to highlight them uh, here because I think they're very worthwhile to ponder. Um, and the first of those um, concerns a brief statement, a short single sentence, basically saying that by completing the digital uh, single market, uh, Europe could boost its GDP by almost 500 billion uh, euros a year. Um, uh, and that is an interesting statement um, and a perspective that, that is somewhat lost later in the document. So, so I would, um, I would uh, recommend everyone to ponder it because that is something that is within the sort of original uh, competency of the European Union creating a sing single market. That's the core competency of the Union. Um, uh, the other thing from the introduction I would like to emphasize um, is um, uh, the um, observation that uh, cybersecurity incidents uh, can be both intentional and accidental um, and it's really important to consider both um, and this is not intended to deny great any of those two threats but both of them have to be kept in mind um, right uh, so in order to describe the, uh, the strategy as a whole basically um, it's um, supposedly based on um, uh, basic principles, um, and the uh, um, the overarching one is that the European Union values uh, apply as much in the digital as in the physical world. That's sort of the tagline uh, being used to to set the, the the concrete policy measures in context. And these policy measures then uh, that are proposed. Um, they're a bit complicated, of course, because the Commission uh, does not have the power to enact all of its uh, propositions. So a lot of them have to work their way through the Parliament, for instance, uh, and also meet the, the approval of, of, the, um, uh, of the Council. Uh, so it's a complicated process. and. and um, uh, well, that also has to be kept in mind when reading these these policy proposals. Uh, but the first area um, that's described in the strategy uh, is about achieving cyber resilience, as it's called. Uh, basically, to make sure that the critical infrastructure that is um, in uh, banks, for instance, or the power grid, uh, and so on, um, uh, all kinds of critical infrastructure today that uh, underpins uh, services uh, and uh, uh, the economic activities throughout the Union, uh, this infrastructure has to be uh, resilient, has to be more resilient uh, than is the case today. Um, and in order to, uh, to foster this, uh, basically uh, the Commission and the strategy uh, proposes legislation that has to pass in Parliament and the Council um, to make sure that the players in this area uh, assess their cybersecurity uh, in a proper way, uh, assess the risks they face, uh, that they carry out appropriate risk management, that they do risk analysis, uh, and also that they share incident uh, 
information uh, with uh, national authorities. Uh, the national authorities of the NIS, uh, basically the authorities pointed out to in the, the policy on network uh, and information security, the NIS directives, uh, or uh, that is uh, an important abbreviation to, to keep in mind here. Um, um, and these policy uh, suggestions then um, are supposed to foster this resilience. Um, if I am to make a slight remark on that, uh, I would say that the Commission has certainly identified a really important area. Um, but it's also uh, uh, not obvious that the measures proposed are necessarily uh, uh, the best ones or, or that they are sufficient. Um, Thinking a bit out of the box, uh, a bolder move would certainly have been, for instance, to try to encourage the uh, uh, the growth of a more mature uh, cyber uh, insurance market. Um, and the reason why this is uh, relevant to ponder is that an insurance market uh, does not prescribe um, solutions from above, but rather sets incentives and then allows the um, innovation process to find the appropriate solutions uh, in a distributed way. Um, and if we don't believe necessarily that the, uh, the Commission and uh, its public um, uh, servants are the best suited to point out uh, the, the appropriate strategies, then it might be a good idea just to set the incentives uh, and uh, properly uh, and then make sure that in a decentralized fashion the appropriate measures uh, are, can, can grow from, from below, so to speak. Um, the second uh, area uh, of the strategy uh, is about drastically reducing cybercrime. Um, and basically um, it notes uh, very correctly that cyber crimes uh, currently are relatively high profit and low risk, and of course, therefore, they attract a lot of, of criminals, uh, and more specifically, it attracts criminal activity that is then being uh, driven by uh, economic incentives. Um, and in the strategy, it's proposed a number of ways to try to, to counter this, uh, most particularly. Um, the, uh, the Commission points to, to the Council of Europe Convention on Cybercrime, commonly known as uh, the Budapest Convention. Um, it still reiterates and urges that the member states who have not signed, Sweden for instance, uh, should, uh, sorry, Sweden has signed but not ratified, and the members who have signed should ratify. And of course, in order to ratify, they should also implement the measures being prescribed. Um, so that's uh, an important measure and also a good example of how this strategy works. The Commission urges the uh, member nations to do something and then it's sort of up to the, uh, the, uh, the countries to, to act on that or not. Um, similarly, the Commission will uh, support the uh, uh, recently launched uh, European Cybercrime Centre, which is a uh, part of Europol. Um, uh, and uh, encourages again uh, this uh, uh, the e C three center uh, to cooperate with uh, Eurojust, um, and all these measures are reasonable, of course, because cybercrime is transnational in its nature, uh, uh, and a lot of it is perpetrated in one country uh, through means that are uh, spread out uh, over many countries and jurisdictions. So it's very clear that if this is to be tackled uh, in an effective way, probably uh, more and better international cooperation is necessary. So in that sense, the strategy makes uh, uh, very much sense. So thirdly, um, the uh, uh, strategy sets out to uh, develop a cyber defense policy uh, and capabilities uh, as well, actually. Um, and Obviously, this relates uh, very much to uh, the previous presentation and the question of the, the NATO capabilities. Um, and therefore, it's, it's logical to note, as does the Commission of the Strategy, uh, that they set out to avoid duplication. Um, uh, they say that you will explore the possibilities to cooperate uh, between the European Union and NATO in order to complement their efforts rather than build uh, duplicate capability. Um, and that seems very appropriate, uh, I would say. 
Um, so I won't uh, go further into this part of the strategy, which is by far the shortest as well, if you look to the document. Now, fourthly, um, the strategy uh, aims to develop um, the industrial and technological uh, resources for cybersecurity. Um, and this is basically a matter of trying to make sure that the private sector um, ensures a high level of cybersecurity. Um, and there are a number of ways that the Commission in Australia sets out to do that. Uh, one of them is to encourage standards, for instance, technical norms of various kinds. Um, uh, and another way uh, is to try to use the uh, European R&D efforts uh, uh, to uh, support an industrial policy, um, creating, a, as they call it, a trustworthy uh, European ICT industry. Um, and if we reflect a bit on these measures, um, they obviously address an important issue, uh, but we can also wonder about how to walk the fine lines uh, needed. For instance, encouraging standards. Um, standards can be very good, um, but there is also risks involved uh, when, whenever setting standards. For instance, uh, you might have uh, current market leaders advocating security standards that fit their own products uh, and are intended to uh, compete out their uh, more uh, innovative uh, competitors. Um, it's easy to imagine, for instance, um, that say 10 or 15 years ago, um, uh, a market leader like Microsoft uh, might have vehemently opposed on security grounds, for instance, the development of, of smartphones and tablets, uh, which were not their cup of tea at the time. Um, they were very content to have our old uh, style personal computers, um, and they were not very keen on having competition fr from uh, uh, other uh, companies such as well, Apple, for instance, uh, in this field. And they could do so with very decent arguments, like what if uh, you collect all of your personal data somewhere in a small device that can easily be hacked and that you carry around all the time. So there are tons of legitimate security concerns. But it's also the case that, uh, well, basically, uh, incumbent market leaders might try to use this to the disadvantage uh, of their competitors. And, and that is Ulrich? the risk, fine line. Um, sorry to intervene here, but um, your time is up. My time is up. Yes. Very good. <laughs> um, then if I Some may just... You will have the opportunity to return very soon. Very good. So if there's something you can say, one sentence more. One sentence yes. more. Uh, fifth point of the strategy. Yes establishing a coherent international cyberspace policy relating to foreign policy. Uh, and we'll get back to that in the discussion, I believe. Thank you very much. A very good and a brief uh, presentation of what's going on in the EU concerning cybersecurity. Uh, and now I welcome uh, Christine Bergtura Sandvik to the podium. Please, the floor is yours. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, thank you for having me and thank you for coming today. I will now perform some peace research, because I think that's what I expected of me. Um, so thank you to the two previous speakers. Um, what I'd like to do is just briefly... I think you should move the mic a little bit further away from the mouth, just... Like this? Yeah. Better? Yes, better. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just briefly touch upon three points that relates to this issue of Article 5, NATO Article 5, um, and, and whether it really makes, makes us more secure. Uh, from my perspective, this really marks the final step of the militarization of cyberspace. And I think it's important to be aware of the fact that this wasn't inevitable. This is a policy choice. This is a way of seeing cyber as an issue of national security instead of societal security, for example. It's also a second really interesting development, and that's that it means that international law threshold questions have become really, really important. But the international law of cyberspace already has a very, very deep geographical basis that makes the kind of international conversation we really need to have about this very difficult to have. Um, but I'll, I'll get back to that. Um, 
So my, my first concern is, you know, what's the point of having an Article 5 clause? First speaker said that this is going to be determined by a case to case basis, and that's of course extremely vague. Um, I'm particularly worried about two things. The first is that it might actually be a better use of resources to spend time and energy mitigating physical effects of attacks in the real world. You know, spend your resources there. Um, the people attacking you will maybe be anonymous. You might not know who it is. There are huge problems of attribution. So, so this whole idea of deterrence might not be very effective in cyberspace. The second is that, yes, NATO is responsible for NATO things, and nation states are responsible for their own critical information infrastructure. But it's not really that easy. You know, things kind of intertwine. As far as I know, nobody really knows what the cyber security status is for each country, each member of NATO. Because division of labor varies within every country, Le threat level varies, threat perceptions varies, the resources invested in this topic really is quite different from country to country, and some countries are more unwilling than others to disclose what their actual threat situation is, right? So maybe in terms of securing uh, countries helping with laws and helping with implementation to protect critical infrastructure would be a better way of investing the resources. Um, comprehensive legal approaches to see cyber as a sort of full domain, ranging from computer law to criminal law to telecommunications law and down. Um, no, it's also about creating accountability structures, you know, creating this culture of cyber security. And, and, you know, I, I could probably have said the same 20 years ago. This whole idea about cyber hygiene measures, for example. I mean, many of you are diplomats. If I was your boss, you would not be able to use a memory stick. I, I think many of you are not at the moment. You would never be allowed to let your child use your work computer to watch a fun ne Netflix program. And you would also never be able to use your work computer to post that picture on Facebook when you're sort of crossing the finishing line at Stockholm Marathon. I mean, they're really sort of basic things about cyber hygiene that we still need to learn and still need to be very diligent about. Um, and, and that's lacking. And you know, there should be accountability structures, meaning that if you, as a leader, fail in this, you might lose your job. I mean, there will be consequences for people. And I, I'm not talking about, you know, really serious violations or enormous attacks, but just that this get more built into the way we are responsible as leaders at work, and so on and so forth. Uh, my last point, and I'll be very quick so we can continue discussing this afterwards. Um, you know, this is, <laughs> having this international conversation about cyber war is, is difficult, right? If you look at legal scholarship, legal scholars have really bought this blaming the Chinese for everything, right? So the Chinese are guilty of, of cyber attacks, of industrial espionage, etc., etc. And then along comes Snowden and the revelation of global NSA surveillance and things become a little bit more complicated. Um, there are problems of internet governance. The US has let go of ICANN, but there are still many, many questions that need to be decided, right? So, so, you know, I come from a country that's a NATO member and we see things in a particular way. But this is a lot about, you know, framing of who's the threat and who's sort of your adversary. Um, in back in 2009, I think, they decided at, at the center in Tallinn to develop a manual on cybersecurity. And they had a very uh, well-respected professor called Michael Schmidt uh, select a group of uh, experts in international law to develop a manual on, on cyber warfare. And this has sort of become the gold standard simply because there is nothing else, right? Um, Michael Schmidt has written on cyber war since the 90s. He selected a group of people that haven't criticized his work. He also describes them as world-class experts. He also says that all reasonable views have been included in the manual. But you know, it's pretty clear that this, this is an issue. In 2011, I was in Tallinn at this annual cyber war conference that NATO has, listening to a participant from I would say the global south, I thought he was Indian. 
asking about the composition of this, this expert group, you know, and, and you could see the expert group. It was, you know, basically white men to, to be. So, I mean, it, it, it's very difficult to have a conversation when that is the basis for what international law is supposed to be about, right? And, and you know, if, if this manual is, is a neutral interpretation of international law, it, it's already sort of hijacked international law in this field, right? So I think what we need is to take a step back and have maybe United Nations taking an initiative. Uh, because US and its allies, NATO, have decided that international law is enough, we don't need a treaty, while China and, and the Shanghai uh, Corporation, they want a new treaty, they want to discuss, they want a different kind of code of conduct. And of course, this, this you know, pertains to difficult questions about freedom of expression, internet governance, and so on and so forth. But I think it would help if we were a little bit more honest about our own motivations and about our own biases and about our own agendas. And now I'm talking globally. So. I think we would be more secure if we did this than if we relied on NATO Article 5 to deter a cyber war. Thank you. Thank you, Christine, uh, for uh, a critical reflection on the, what you call the militarization of uh, cyberspace and uh, whether Article 5 uh, is applicable or not, or you even useful here. Uh, thank you so much. And now uh, we have some comments from Lars Nikander. Director of the uh, Center for Asymmetric Threat Studies. Thank you. And an experienced expert on these issues here in Sweden. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, I think we have to. I want to start with um, the role of, uh, about the vulnerability of our societies, our information societies. It g goes back to the President's Commission on Critical Infrastructure Protection, 96, uh, the Marsh Commission in the US. Everyone started to think that. Uh, we might be sitting in a glass house here. But the real wake-up call was, the, as mentioned here before, the bronze statue incident in Tallinn, 2007. And wh what was found then was that the international legal assistance treaties was not enough. Because uh, you try to go back uh, and do tracebacks and uh, if you're not within the Five Eyes system, you have to have a uh, police call an attorney call, to call an attorney in another country, etc. It takes time. But it, uh, the Estonians tried, went to Germany, etc. But when Germany wanted to have assistance from Russia, they said no, it's not in the treaties for legal assistance to attacks on critical infrastructure. And uh, thanks, but no thanks. EU tried to start to look into that, how can we change those treaties, but uh, I don't think there has been any progress there. But um, that was also a wake-up call for, for using uh, cyber attacks in some form as a mil uh, mean for non-military exercise uh, uh, of power in the, uh, in the security, po security policy domain. And, it might be a preamble for the hybrid war we've seen in Ukraine these days. But anyway, what was uh, viewed then was that there was a need for cooperation due to the antagonistic threats. And, uh, that, uh, uh, and because the cyberspace is borderless. So uh, the discussion and discourse started to move in two directions, and for starting from two ends. The first was the top-down approach, cyber norms. Can we have any, have any international legal norms to really the, the holy grail of the information insurance business? Can we find near real time rules of engagement for uh, law enforcement for near real-time traceback to, to avoid this problem, to deny safe haven for rogue actors in, in any part of the world? And uh, Hillary Clinton, when she was Secretary of State, She's tried to start a dialogue on this, and um, um, she, she approached European Union, but um, then came up the other problem here, and which has been, uh, uh, still is the, the biggest problem, the split respons responsibility. Uh, within member states, who's in charge of these uh, issues? Uh, it's, uh, it's split between the defense ministries, uh, justice, interior, minister of foreign affairs, trade and enterprise. And that kind of split is also 
the same within the European Union, between the different commissions. So when US called EU, who should we call? They got in trouble. And they, it ended up with three commissioners who should be in charge of this uh, to have the dialogue with US. So you need an, an outside force to get something to happen. And um, th these kind of initiatives and cyber norms uh, were quite uh, going uh, intensive for some years. But then, as was mentioned here, due to the split within uh, ITU and others about the internet governance, the, the foundation about uh, having a whole uh, the internet coherent has uh, been the, the state until today has slowed down different interpretations of what's information uh, and the freedom of expression, etc. So the top-down approach has been uh, losing pace. The other w thing which is more uh, ongoing and more fruitful, I think, is the bottom-up approach. How to shape resilient societies and uh, critical information infrastructure protection programs. Uh, EU started uh, with um, quite wide with a big a big agenda because they th said we have the mandate and we have the money, but they didn't have the structure. They started with Indonesia in, in, uh, in Crete, and uh, uh, until very recently they didn't have broadband. Uh, they also focused on cybercrime, and that have have been um, developed quite good. And I think that's the future maybe for European Union in a role play between NATO. If they focus on the cybercrime and the awareness, research and development and standardization, those kind of issues, to not duplicate what NATO is doing. And that's stressed many times here, to avoid duplication, because 23 of 28 countries are part of both. So, and. I think NATO have a success story with this CCD, CUE in Tallinn. And I think the center of gravity between the European Union and NATO will be, end up there. And the European Defense Agency, the, the defense policy arm of EU, have moved more and more to uh, Tallinn and uh, sent up service there. And now uh, almost every uh, country is a member of the uh, CCD, CUE. And that kind of E technical exercises, cyber defense exercises, is very uh, crucial to raise the level of where, where do we have problems in our societies. Education and exercises. I think that's the non sexy part of uh, cyber security, but it's very important. I think i stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lars, very much uh, for your reflections. And uh, I will now invite all of the panelists up here. So we will have uh, a talk amongst ourselves for just uh, a few minutes. <coughs> so, we have heard now how uh, NATO and the European Union and their member states uh, have been uh, at least talking about cybersecurity for a very long time and updated their strategies. And NATO is now even saying that Article 5 is applicable to cyber attacks on a case by case basis. And uh, <coughs> we have also seen a shift of leadership in both organizations. The EU has a new commission, and uh, NATO has shifted the uh, Secretary General. Still, um, uh, power stays within the Nordic countries, from Denmark to Norway, Jens Stoltenberg now. Uh, maybe that uh, matters something. But I, what I would like you to address now um, is, okay, we have seen, uh, and they, there's a lot of strategic analysis going on. And they uh, have quite broad uh, views of what kind of threats are out there. We see maybe they, they are aware of problems of du duplication, and uh, as Lars suggested, uh, Maybe the EU is more focused on the so-called civilian problems or cybercrime, and NATO is more focused on cyber defense and military aspects. On the other hand, there is a lot of talk about dual use, and uh, that the boundary between what is civilian really and what is military is very hard to distinguish. 
these days. Um, but then, my main question to you is, okay, um, so there, we have these strategies, we have these papers, documents and uh, declarations, but what about real capacities? Uh, what, what are your reflections and your critical reflections on this? Are these words matched by real capacity today? So what's missing here? Who would like to start addressing that? Well, Bart, uh, uh, okay, Thomas, give it a shot at least. Yes. Um, well, strategies and policy are in place and will continuously be developed. Capacity to do something about it. Um, from a NATO point of view, they are trying to both enhance the security of the actual networks and also build capability within uh, detection of, uh, of attacks, uh, forensic analysis and capability to trace back where things come from, um, and the capability to, to survey the net for potential, potential uh, future attacks. However, all of this is centered around uh, a crisis incident center, which is being enhanced. It was built or approved in 2012, and is now being built and has just reached what is called full operational capability. Um, so capabilities are starting to match the, the policies and the strategies, but I guess there's still, still a long way to go. As, uh, as the threats and the risks continuously develop, it gets more complex, and in between with more and more policy areas, so should the, the capability also follow. And that will be a constant chase between what is threats and perceptions of them, what materializes into current revisions of policy all the time, and then what is the current need for, for capability. So it will continuously be a, be a trace. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, Ulrich, would you like to continue? Well, I can just make a short remark. That as for the European Union, um, it is hampered to some extent by, by the process of, of policy formulation. So the Commission has released a strategy document, but it remains to pass through the Parliament and, and the Council. Um, and well, that is interesting to, to keep in mind. The timetables are not set, and it's not clear what actually ends up being the case. Mm. Okay, thank you, uh, Christine. Uh, I think the worst thing that could happen, or maybe the least productive, is, is sort of a competition or overlapping of, of functions and activities. Um, the same crew that was creating the manual is now busy creating a cybersecurity manual for NATO to be published in 2014 of the same world-class group of experts. And they're covering a really wide range of international legal instruments and legal fields. And you can easily see that this will become quite a muscular manual and, and be fed into EU processes, which will of course also impinge on, on EU initiatives and, and maybe even make standard setting in the EU difficult and very much tied to NATO, uh, which I think would be, be a bad idea. Yeah, Lars? Uh, I see, see healthy signs, as I mentioned, that the EU, there's, it's common insight within the EU that they have overstretched their role in cyber defense policy. Still, they try to write the strategies, etc., from EDA. But as they focus in on supporting CCDC UE, which will become the, the uh, crisis management, technical crisis managed cyber defense crisis management uh, uh, vehicle, or for both organizations, uh, as this is not a part of NATO, it's accredited by NATO, it could be useful for uh, all of um, for both organizations. And I think that's very healthy. And uh, the, uh, those, uh, the more countries that, that the more the, this goes in this direction, that your, the role play become clearer, that will uh, benefit all of us. Yeah, I would briefly just concur with Lars on that. I was very happy to see that the EU strategy actually had the wordings that they want explicitly to avoid duplicating the capabilities that are already there within NATO. So that's a good sign. Um, so um, then would you, just to summarize uh, your very uh, uh, interesting comments that 
I mean, the, we have planning on, on these levels, on the international level. We have some strategies. There are some capacities being developed. Maybe even uh, there is some, even, and some, uh, some uh, responsibility questions here, uh, competition. But then mainly the real uh, assets to develop resilience against suburb problems remains within the member states still today. Would you agree with that? Yes, to a very high degree. Uh, looking at both NATO and EU and, and development of capabilities, enhancing the role and responsibilities of the Center of Excellence and Talent um, and other institutions within EU and within NATO, uh, that is still predominantly to protect EU and NATO's own capabilities and own infrastructure. It is, as you say, national responsibility and mm -hmm. it can only be a national responsibility to actually develop the actual resilience mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and capabilities to, to conduct cyber defense. Mm -hmm. But that also leaves the policies developed by the two international organizations as roadmaps. NATO has absolutely no uh, sort of way of forcing the nations to, to do anything. EU, I believe, have a few more incentives uh, to get the nations to do something concrete about it. But in the end of the day, it is a, a national responsibility. Oh. Thank you. Anyone else would like to respond? Uh, to just, uh, of course, there are problems within NATO and, uh, and as well as within the EU as, uh, as well, due to the different security policy orientation and alliances and the maturity on cyber security issues. It's not the same between all countries uh, in NATO or in the EU. That's another complicating factor which must be taken into account. Christine? But it, it's not only the... Hello? Yes? It's not only the complicating factor, it's also this considerable level of tension between NATO member states at the moment with respect to everything cyber. I mean, if you're going to defend me, are you at all going to tell me which capabilities you will defend me with, right? Are you going to show me your full hand of offensive cyber weapons? Mm -hmm. So I, as a different member country, can know I can rely on you. I mean, so, so I, you know, in terms of investing in, in decreasing tension between NATO member states, that mm -hmm. might be something that needs a little bit more, uh, more focus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um. Okay, um, thank you. Um, I will open up for questions from the audience. And um, I think there will be several already, some hands are being raised. And now we have, uh, my colleagues, we have microphones. So uh, when you have the chance uh, to ask a question, you will talk in the microphone and you will say uh, your name and who you are. And then uh, ask a question, a brief, clear question. We don't want any mini lectures or your own statements. So we want questions, okay, for the discussion. Please. Okay, I will collect a few questions at once. So, so here is one. Ulf Svensson, Swedish Pagwash. In the United States there has been a discussion, a heated discussion, on a, a militarization of cyberspace. And there is a conflict between uh, Homeland Speaking Security the and the Defense. Is there any such uh, discussion anywhere in the EU, EU? Is it different in different EU countries? The reaction to the NSA activities was, for instance, much, much stronger in Germany than in Sweden, maybe called, because of the FRA. But what, how will that uh, lead to cyber defense of the, of the civilian infrastructures? Should the military deal with that? Should I, would that be a militarization of cyberspace? Okay, thank you uh, very much for a question about the NSA and reactions. Uh, we have a question here. Uh, uh, microphone, please. <laughs> okay, I will stand so I don't have to yeah. put them back. My name is Karsten Fries. I work in Oslo, Norwegian Institute of International Affairs. I would like to follow up my Norwegian colleague's question about do we need Article 5? I think it's a good question. Um, if, and my question is, as, if 95-98% of all cyber activity is, can be defined as crime, and then there's a few percentage that might be defined, a bit, bit defined as something in between with espionage, which is crime slash political, and a very small percentage is, is actually kind of attack. Why? When? How? When do we? We talk so much about defense, which is basically addressing that last percentage, that all the rest should be addressed as crime. Why do you talk so much about defense, and how do we go from 
from from the crime approach, which is which is police and judiciary, and to the defense, which is very different way of mindset. How do we how do we it's go clear. along that line? Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Crime or uh, war, basically. <laughs> uh, one more question over here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Björn Karlsson. I'm, I'm sort of an old consultant on international development cooperation and sort of on global issues, uh, global governance of, of, of different kinds. Uh, one general question. Uh, are we seeing the end of globalization now when we are seeing sort of the internet being divided up? I mean, there are large areas of the earth where, where sort of the internet is not really working openly. China, Russia, and probably a number of other countries are increasingly becoming defensive. Second, um, on this, uh, the military side, I mean, obviously nowadays, military capabilities are very much dependent on the guidance systems, the uh, um, uh, is in, in space, the, 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 uh, the, the ability to monitor and gear your, your ordinance in, in, in different ways. Uh, third, um, increasingly we are looking at uh, the, uh, global financial systems and perhaps it is breaking up. Today we, we know that this, the SWIFT international banking system uh, has been um, used uh, to isolate Iran for instance. So, so that's out. And the question has been raised whether the SWIFT system should be utilized or to, to, um, against Russia for as as part of a sort of a sanction system. Now, you are the expert on these things. It would be nice to see the issues perhaps raised a little bit above the question uh, whether NATO or EU uh, uh, okay. cyber security. Thank you. We'll see how we can tackle these uh, even broader global questions. Uh, so we have, uh, I think we'll stop there for now. We have three questions. One here about uh, basically the NSA debate and the various reactions in Europe. And the second uh, was, uh, we'll, we'll start with that one first. So who would like to address that? Thomas. I can start. I'm volunteers. sure that Kirsten will follow up in a very yes. short second. Yes. Uh, we don't know anything about what goes on in the EU. <laughs> uh, you don't have any spies <laughs> or allies? Well, as it goes to the US, as you call it, heated debate about uh, the militarization of cyber, that debate is not in the same way going on in Europe, not even after Snowden. Uh, what is remarkable to see is that you had a very quick hype about several heads of states complaining to the US about the surveillance of cyberspace. But it ended up slowly, especially with Germany, to come to a complete halt when they themselves got exposed for doing cyber surveillance and telephone surveillance and whatnot. And that has all been out in public. Um, so speaking about cyber defense and automatically making a link to that equals militarization of cyber. Um, it does, and that goes into the Article 5 question as well. Because, well, for NATO's sake, the vocabulary that NATO have is securitized. So it cannot really discuss policy in other, any other ways than in the security framework. Um, and therefore, it per default becomes uh, securitized. Um, Thank you. Uh, Christine? And I, I just wanted to add that I, I think in terms of, of the debate after Snowden, it's shifting in, in quite interesting ways. I mean, things are happening to Google, for example, and particularly in Germany, where, you know, Springer has issues with, with Google's market share. But so, so part of the Snowden is actually being channeled into, you know, the right to be forgotten, mm. uh, and uh, basically also who Google is in terms of relationship to U.S. national security. Um, can I answer the second question, or should we yes, move on? Yes, you can. You go yes. ahead. No, with Karsten's question about, about cyber crime, I, I think you know it's quite boring that Anissa doesn't have had broadband until recently. You know, cyber crime is the real issue. That's the issue that affects people worldwide. Uh, if you are poor, you will have a cheap cell phone, and you will be able to afford poor security solutions for your website, right? So this is also becoming sort of a digital gap in terms of who will get attacked and who will be be more at risk. I, I think you know it ties in with this general overlap between military action 
and, and policing and, and law enforcement adopting more and more military technology. You know, there's no reason why they're not also going to, you know, ad eventually adopt more sort of military style cyber tactics and tools. But I, I think it's really something we need to discuss also in terms of where the funding is put. If you look at how this affects people's everyday life, you know, how many people get their identity stolen? I just got an email from, from Target a couple of months ago. I used to live in the US and, and had an account. I've forgotten about the account. But they were hacked so badly that they offered their customers free insurance. That means they were hacked pretty badly. You know, they lose your identity and your identity card and your numbers and your everything right, left and center. And I think we're only seeing the beginning of this yet. So, so I agree with you. You know, most of this is cybercrime and this is how it's going to affect people on the ground. Uh, uh, Ulrich, yeah, then well, I have a, a reflection relating to this question of, of crime versus war, uh, and I would say that that is a false dichotomy. Uh, we also have the non-adversarial threats, uh, the everyday outages, uh, which are simply due to poor quality assurance or, or uh, insufficient risk analysis or, or uh, lack of plans of business continuity. Uh, and that must not be forgotten because it's an important part of being cyber secure or cyber resilient or whatever we would like to call it. Um, and making everyone more mature in this respect uh, is, is really important. Uh, Lars? Uh, I must say, I think this, these kind of borderlines between military and civilian is obsolete today. It, it doesn't matter. This, uh, you don't know who's at the other end, and when you try to find out is it a law enforcement matter or a military matter, it's too late. And uh, you, you must have dual capacities here. The taxpayer shouldn't same, pay the same thing twice. It's, a, it's about, uh, you need to uh, uh, master the whole full spectrum view of different kind of threats. You don't know what the threats in, 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 uh, are at forehand. And these kind of laws which uh, go, uh, govern uh, international conflicts, they seemed outdated already in 99 at the Bosnia crisis. Because the Admiral Ellis, who was head of this campaign, said we could half the length of the campaign if we had can use information operation means fully, but they couldn't because th this kind of difference between civilian and military. It was okay to bomb a military truck on a bridge, 15 uh, casualties, dead civilian, but it was not okay to cut the telephone wire because that went to the Ministry of Terrorists, paramilitary troops who did the worst atrocities. But that was a civilian, and these kind of laws are. Uh, relics from the, from the 19th century uh, Napoleonic Wars. And, and so it must be updated. And the Swedish parliament has uh, also uh, said that it's time to look at it uh, again. Uh, we have a short reflection from, uh, from Thomas and then from Christine. Yeah. Very shortly. Um, I do fully agree with you, Lars, on, on the artificiality and the obsoleteness of, of the civilian military delineation between both capabilities and targets. Uh, looking at what goes on in, today in Ukraine, in Syria, in other places where, where there's active conflicts now, uh, either classified as war or civil war or whatever, uh, you see an increased amount of third party actors who are not aligned to any state or international organization, who actively take part in the cyber warfare or whatever you would like to call it, making this uh, much more hybrid. Uh, and therefore, these delineations and saying that, well, if you militarize some parts of cyber, then it all becomes weaponized or whatever. It, it is one big blur that is very, very hard to delineate, delineate as it is today. And that's just a, a reflection on it. Mm -hmm. yep. So just I think this idea about calling this obsolete is absolutely horrible. Um, international humanitarian law applies in armed conflict. In international humanitarian law, and, and you, you know, we've spoken today about how we're not going to see a pure cyber war. We're going to see cyber as part of an offensive attack, for example. Humanitarian international law permits casualties. If Saddam Hussein or Osama bin Laden was here, we could all die and it would be fine according to national humanitarian law. They permit civilian casualties. If you are in peacetime, human rights applies. It's law enforcement. This is an important distinction. You know, we're not, we're not playing around here. 
Like war has to be war and peace has to be peace. And most countries on earth are not Syria or Ukraine. Secondly, to start renegotiating treaties is a really, really dangerous business, right? I mean, what sort of international instrument do you think we could get at today if we opened the Geneva Conventions again? So they're old, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, they've been developed slowly, the ones you had in the 18th century, 19th century, and so on and so forth. But these are sort of the basic moral underpinnings of an international community. I mean, it's very hard to envision that we would get anything much more progressive out of trying to sit down internationally today. In any event, who would do this, right? The five countries or whatever that are at the Security Council, you know, it's very, you know, it's very difficult to imagine reopening those negotiations and coming up with something better. So stick with what we have and then try to interpret. Yes, okay, just yes, quick. Yeah, I think this is, uh, it's been tried, it's been, it's been discussed, but when was the war declared between states? during the last years, not even the Korea War. It's, it's a, the, the real world outside. They don't, people, states don't declare war against each other. They do it anyway. And we can't just sit backbinded where you have formal declarations of war. And then the, 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 you will have a problem, problem with the, what's the applicability of the conduct of war. But the humanitarian law has been applied uh, over the last two decades, you know, law of armed conflict has been applied to the conflicts yes. without declarations of war. Yes, but the, the stage before, the crisis, etc., the, the more crisis than there are wars, and still you must uh, act within, uh, that's the most uh, uh, usual uh, state. And uh, if you just focus on war, it's not so useful. Um, and just to interject, I think this is a fascinating topic and we haven't replied to all of your questions yet, but uh, well, usually we, we have seen that uh, cyber attacks, we will limit ourselves to that discussion, they usually or maybe never lead to bloodshed. They, you lose, there's a destruction of bits and, and uh, bytes and, and money is lost and so on, and, uh, but, and communication is lost and credibility is lost, so forth. But people don't really die through cyber attacks as of yet, as that, that we know of. So um, that's just a reflection. Another reflection is that the politics that goes in in calling something, and, uh, I'm uh, not a lawyer, I'm a political scientist, so I see how important it is, what power there is in calling something cybercrime or calling it cyber war. Even w when an incident is happening, okay, we can see there's something going on in our computer systems, things we can't access, uh, our banks and uh, that hotel shut down in Tallinn and, and so forth. So, and okay, then at that stage when we don't really know at all what's going on, who's doing it, and nobody has said we are attacking you, okay, then there's a tendency for some people to say, here's a cyber crime going on, and others who say, no, there's some kind of cyber war going on. And that has political implications because it means the police will be responsible if the cyber crime, or the military or some other units will be responsible. So that has tremendous political implications. That's just my own reflections. And maybe uh, returning to, there was one question about, uh, uh, that was three part question about uh, the end of. Uh, globalization or is there a development, this is sort of a different question but still it's uh, relevant here, um, do we see the development of many in internets or national intranets perhaps? Anyone would like to respond to that? Well, I could Ulrich. make two reflections on that. The first one is that yes, that's obviously the case. As you mentioned, there are uh, countries that try to seal their nets off the rest of the world, uh, basically uh, in order to, to, well, they claim that it is to maintain some kind of stability and so forth. Um, and that's the obvious one, uh, and it's something that uh, is frequently being addressed, for instance, in the EU's uh, foreign policy on this, stressing that human rights must apply, etc., must not have limitations on freedom of speech. But there is a second, less obvious aspect of this, uh, and that has to do with uh, the risk that uh, the perception of great cyber threats uh, will lead countries to increasingly become protectionist and buy only products from their own countries and so on, uh, basically uh, ending globalization and, and trade and, and ICT uh, goods and services. Uh, that's less commonly thought about, but probably at least as important. Anyone else would like to reflect on that question? No? no? Uh, yes. Yes. 
I, I think you're absolutely right, and I think you were the one who put up the thresholds, the sort of the cost trade-off discussions. And I think as researchers, we need to be much better at placing those trade-offs in the public domain. You know, do you want to have critical information infrastructure protection, or do you want to modernize your infrastructure, for example? I mean, you know, we're not never going to have perfect security. At which cost? You know, and, and I think you know, maybe as academics, this is something we can do much better. You know, making clear to the public. Yeah, what well, the trade-offs are. I, I agree. I get back to those 500 billion uh, euros of GDP growth uh, that the EU presumes would uh, uh, be there if only the single market for for single digital market were to be realized. That's a lot of money. Uh, it must not be forgotten. Uh, okay, we have time for uh, another round of questions from the audience. Do we have anyone who would like to ask a question? Yes, over here. My name is uh, Vincent Boulenin. I'm working at CIPRI. On, I'm uh, actually on cyber security and cyber warfare. Uh, my question is, um, I would like to, to move on the debate. We, so far we are focused on the Western understanding of cyber, so focusing on the physical infrastructures, on hardware, on software, on the kind of attacks that are against them. Um, with the crisis in Ukraine and the crisis in Georgia in 2008, it was interesting to analyze that cyber attacks were mainly used for propaganda purposes. And the NATO strategy and the EU policy only focused on the cyber, the Western cyber understanding of the issue. So I would be interested to see, to know whether you know if um, NATO and the EU are actually considering having a policy regarding the wider information warfare or information security questions. How can, the, how can Western state uh, react to uh, propaganda, propaganda action or attacks? Um, because the attacks in Ukraine, for example, in the Ukraine crisis, are fairly low level. They were not necessarily extremely sophisticated, but they are the, the primary purposes was to spread out this information on confusion and also spread out information to the wider international yes. community. Yeah. Um, thank you. The wider question about information warfare and cyber is an aspect of that. Any other question from the audience right now? Yes, over here. I'm Yngve Sundblad and a member of Swedish Pagwash and also a professor of computer science actually. Uh, I think that uh, most of the uh, cyber attacks so far we have seen, as you already mentioned, have been more mainly civilian than military, but also mixed in a way. And I see a specific risk on, on using the possibility to, to uh, cyber attacks for infrastructures of different kinds, for energy systems and so on, uh, both civilian and connected with the military com or a conflict in general. So do you have any comments on that? Uh, well, uh, for now, we'll, okay, we'll take these two questions. Uh, so, first, the question on information warfare. Who would like to address that? Uh, Lars. Uh, originally, this concept uh, about cyber security, cyber warfare, was a part of the wider concept of information operations uh, in a military context. And information operations was, just, uh, was not only cyber. Uh, computer network attack. It was also the, the strategic communication part and the uh, information campaign part. And I think that's very important uh, to recognize. But the uh, modern society, Western society, doesn't have any other defense against this than to educate, uh, have, try to have an educated debate and, and uh, uh, vaccinate people and journalists to be more critical against uh, the troll armies from Putin in uh, Peter Pittsburgh, who goes into the, the comment fields in the uh, all papers, etc., and, and even on Twitter. So, I think we not have really don't haven't considered it, but it's not a, a really a government part to do something actually about that more than to uh, be uh, raise the awareness and analyze this, but. It's, it's the free media we have. We, we, it's just to have more knowledge and, and awareness against this. Mm. More knowledge and awareness. Okay, uh, any other response on the information warfare? Yes, uh, Thomas. Yes, and then one. 
I don't agree with you that it's only for propaganda purposes. Not even if you look at the Georgian uh, 2008 or, or Ukraine. To a very high degree you see, of course, the visible part of it is what you can call propaganda or information operations or whatever label you want to put on it. But you can also see the internet and particularly social media being used for targeting, uh, singling out networks and individuals. You see it for intelligence collection, which is a military function. You see it for uh, actual defense or attack purposes. Um, and you see it for command and control purposes, uh, especially non-state actors. And state actors with very weak internet resources will resort to using the internet for command and control to facilitate communication, uh, coordinate and synchronize uh, activities on ground. Um, you'll see very large degree of perhaps not very sophisticated, but still very effective denial of service attacks combined with military uh, action on ground, which combined will give you a very very good effect, um, where you can utilize the internet and par paralysis of an opponent's command and control, their ability to communicate between themselves. Instead of bombing something, then you can simply just shut down a uh, large part of their CIS systems um, and then thereby get the same effect as you would bombing. Uh, so I, to a very high degree, see the internet and social networks being used for for broad range of military uh, things within the confound of information warfare. Mm -hmm. uh, Christine, you disagree? Oh, uh, I'll pass. You'll pass. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, okay. Uh, what about uh, the other question here? And I'm sure, not sure if I got it uh, right. It was about civilian and military systems. Or the threats to the infrastructure. The, to the infrastructure. Uh, who would like to respond to that? Uh, Lars again? Uh, th that's the core of the threat against all modern societies. The, the SCADA systems uh, for the power grids and the interconnections with the uh, ISPs, etc. That's the real core. And uh, a, p uh, a country that wants to harm another country and take it down should, of course, aim for that. That's civilian infrastructure. You take, go for the body politics, so to speak, in that country instead of uh, going against uh, militaries and armies. So that's why this, these kind of, of borderlines between military and civilian get blurred, because who has the capacity to stand up and, and uh, counter those uh, uh, threats and attacks? We can't then have one military system, one uh, uh, civilian system because it costs very much to have those kind of gears and, and computers it's, it's tough to analyze what's going on. Mm -hmm. Christine? It's also quite interesting the way we keep creating new vulnerabilities, right? I mean, once you get civil airspace open for drones and for commercial uses and government uses. You're going to go through a period of five to ten years when you have unprofessional operators, where they have poor training, where security is you know, problematic, where the technical stuff fails, where it falls down in people's head, etc., 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 and is hacked. Right? So we're, we're looking at, you know, a whole new face of, of being vulnerable again, right? And I'm sure that after the drones, there will be something else. Um, yes. Uh, anyone else would like to? Uh, a yeah. small okay. reflection yes. relating to to this uh, critical infrastructure part. Uh, I would like to concur with what Christine said earlier about the importance of international humanitarian law because that is one of the uh, set of rules we have to to try to to maintain this uh, separation between uh, legitimate military targets and the rest which is not. Then of course we cannot in our defense assume that the adversary will respect those laws, but there is a point to try to maintain that difference. Lars? Um, one interesting example about the offensive use of these kind of um, computer network attacks. It was discussed in the late 90s uh, by a, 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 a guy from JAG, a naval uh, judge in US who made his thesis about looking at use of force versus use of armed force and went through the 40 cases in the International Court of Hague and found this interesting piece in the UN Charter, Article 41, interruption on post and telecommunications with other means. He applied that on the sanction of Rhodesia in the 60s and said, have, had the society used, uh, international society used that, we have got much more effect for, uh, for that. And uh, that was also raised here in Sweden, uh, this kind of debate. 
could this be used under international law species? And uh, the Swedish parliament uh, endorsed that kind of uh, view in 2000 in, in a uh, decision. So it, it's pro and cons. It's not just for, for bad. It, no, not, so much, so not so many body bags then. Um, well, thank you. Uh, we have now. I will now give uh, your, you, the four of you panelists, uh, a chance for some concluding comments, if you would like, uh, and then we will end the seminar. So, unfortunately, no, we don't have time for any more questions. Thank you. So, Thomas, would you like to say something? Very briefly. Uh, what challenges this most is the merging of, due to the internet and the. Ab abilities that the internet afford a lot of different actors. The merging between what is state, what is non-state, what is third party, uh, such as Anemonis, who has just announced that they will go after IS in Iraq uh, via cyber attacks because they don't like them. Uh, who are the actors actually uh, in this domain? They are not strictly state anymore and therefore it creates a lot of different, different issues in regards to international humanitarian law. Also, nearly everything we see it's very hard to pinpoint what is an actual cyber attack. And loads of what goes on are small drips under the threshold of what can invoke any sort of international legal re uh, reaction. And therefore, the accumulation of a lot of under the threshold things might actually constitute offensive actions, but we can simply not codify them. Secondly, the responsibility of it. How can we actually attribute any of all of these things to a specific actor who is rely who we can hold responsible for this in a legal sense um, and just for for the thought of it imagine the attribution question being solved then 90 percent of all academic debates on this would disappear <laughs> you're here i'm not sure about that <laughs> okay ulrich right so i guess i would like to stress that I mean, we have seen a tr transition here where security, cyber security has, has gone from being sort of a limited technical concern to being on the policy level, as we've been discussing today. Um, and that entails difficult trade-offs uh, because you can no longer just aim to be as secure as possible. You also have to weigh that against other values and the costs. And you have to make sure that you find the most appropriate measures. You have to make sure that you find the appropriate division of labor between uh, international organizations, as we've been discussing today, uh, national governments and the private sector. Um, uh, so there is a lot of work to be done thinking about that division of labor and making sure that we don't do uh, or take measures that are not as effective as they could have been. Thank you, Ulrich. Uh, Christine? Just very brief things at the end. I think your point about design failure and, and production failure is well taken. You know, very often technology will just fail because it was badly made. We need to remember that. You know, sometimes <coughs> there is no one behind this. Mm. Um, the second is, is Internet of Things. I mean, your, your, your oven, your fridge, your whatever will be connected to the internet, right? How do we think about that? Uh, if you're thinking about, you know, number of, if your toaster, if all of your toasters suddenly stopped, you know, working, is that sort of a offensive attack? Because they stopped working simultaneously. No, I'm joking now, but you know, it might be more serious things that stop working. But the internet of things is gonna put the whole new, challenge on the table, particularly in light of what we now know about the difficulty in updating security software for these kind of uh, installments. And most of you, like me, we're just plain old, right? We're born before social media, and you know we even went to school before 1994, when everybody got emails. So, so I think there's also a generational gap in, in who are the decision makers, right? So the decision makers of the future, they're they're born with internet, they have kind of different ideas about privacy, about what it means to share, about what is private, what is public, what should be public, what is political. And, and you know, one man's crime is another man's cyber attack. And, and I think we really need to try to have a more sophisticated debate about everything that's under the threshold of war. Mm. Yes, thank you. Uh, Lars? Um, to put some proportions on this as well, I think the risk of cyber conflict is quite overstated between the states. 
if you see, uh, we've discuss, been discussing China versus US uh, earlier before, but if the Chinese should do anything serious against US, they shoot themselves in the foot. They own uh, they, all the US <laughs> debt, etc. So the interdependence here, it, all are sitting in the same glass house. So I think the Stuxnet w might be the highest level we will see because that's what uh, a surgical uh, attack, something like that. It's n in really in no one's interest to, to uh, among uh, states to get it on a higher level. Good, so we shouldn't be too worried about a global cyber war anyway. Well, that will conclude this seminar. I hope you all feel a little bit more enlightened uh, and we have addressed very uh, many and uh, difficult questions and uh, thank you all. So I, I think our panelists deserve a warm round of applause. Thank you.